Welcome to all our uh, attendees uh, uh, tonight. Um, we are uh, very privileged to have uh, Associate Professor John uh, Orchard uh, AM as our speaker for tonight. And Professor Orchard uh, is an adjunct professor at the Sydney School of Public Health. He is a sports and exercise physician with over 20 years experience. And he is an expert in muscle and tendon injuries and their non-surgical management. He uses treatment uh, modalities such as uh, exercise programs, shockwave, PRP, uh, and injections as appropriate. But uh, I don't think he's a big fan of cortisone injections, but uh, more of that uh, during uh, uh, John's presentation. As I said, he has a substantial uh, uh, experience, which also includes um, being medical officer to uh, uh, elite sporting teams, uh, including Cricket uh, Australia and Cricket New South Wales, the uh, Sydney Roosters NRL team, uh, the New South Wales State of Origin Rugby League team, uh, and the Sydney Swans AFL team. Uh, but look, tonight he's not representing uh, uh, any of those uh, bodies and his opinions are all his own. And as I said, tonight he will give us an update on musculoskeletal and sports medicine in primary care with what I think you'll find is a little bit of a twist. And I, I don't think there's a pun there. Over to you, John. Hey, thanks. Thanks very much, Peter, um, um, for that introduction. And yeah, I hope I'll keep everyone awake um, who um, is on the um, on the session tonight. Yeah, it'll be a little bit unconventional, and um, some of you might find it unconventional, refreshing, and others might find un unconventional um, a bit edgy. And um, really happy to have a good Q and A session at the end with some feedback, both positive and negative, and. Um, hopefully, um, if most of you stay on the line, I'll take it that um, not too many have um, um, thrown something at the screen in disgust and hung up. So, um, but um, I'll start to share my screen so we can go through the presentation and I will do a slideshow from the beginning and that's looking good on my screen, I reckon. Is that okay for you, Lydia and Peter? All good? Yep, all good, John. Excellent. All right. Um, so, yeah, the topic, very broad musculoskeletal um, sports and exercise medicine update. And we started off with refining a few subtopics that we're going to concentrate on. And um, I'm going to start actually, th th this is just a, I'll go into the topics in a second, but this is, um, this is a fun intro. Um, so this is a photo of me from 2007 and a photo of me from 2020. And as you can see, I was a lot better looking in the 2007 photo. Um, and I'm a little bit older now in 2020. And we can't do any, I'd love to still look like I did in 2007, but we can't do anything about it. And that's a deliberate analogy that I'll run um, about um, aging because the musculoskeletal system is very subject to aging. And one of the jokes that I make, um, which is not, um, it's neither optimistic nor pessimistic, I don't think, is that um, ageing is not great, but it's better than the alternative. So, um, you know, the more cynical version is that Amy Winehouse discovered the cure for um, osteoarthritis. You cure yourself at 27 and then you won't um, have to suffer the ravages of osteoarthritis. But if you live to a good old age, all of us who are lucky enough to have a nice long life, and we should consider ourselves lucky, we get to middle age and beyond. Um, we're going to be dealing with osteoarthritis and musculoskeletal de degeneration, just as we're dealing with reading glasses, which I wish I didn't have to put up with, but I do. Um, and um, wrinkles on our face and um, you know, teeth that aren't as good, in a good condition as they were when I was younger either, which I'm sure affects everyone else on the um, session tonight. So, and then I've got a little um, version of my car in 2020 is a lot better than my car in 2007. That's a Tesla I drive and I'll refer back to that later on in the talk. Um, so I was asked initially to cover, you know, soft tissue injuries, hip, groin, elbow, and then someone said, can you throw in knee injuries as well? And um, if you really like tonight, whoever said throw in knee injuries um, can get the credit. And if you hate tonight, you can blame whoever asked for knee injuries to be thrown in. So I, I do have a few um, strong opinions on musculoskeletal medicine, which you'll no doubt get the hint about very shortly. Um, but the opinions are most backed by data with respect to knee and knee osteoarthritis. So I'm 
half the presentation is on me and that's what I'm going to start with and it will involve ripping apart what I got taught in most of my training and what I did early in my career and trying to pin it all back together again in a better spot space than um, where we are at the moment. Um, so I'll start with some good news in that um, although a lot of what I learnt about in sports medicine training I now have to disregard because it's turned out to be false or unhelpful. Um, the good news is that the value of exercise um, in terms of preventing and treating major diseases is far, far greater than I ever would have dreamt of when I first started. So um, I've got a specialty that's lost a lot of its um, structure that it was built on, but the fundamental thing that it is built on, which is exercise as a medical treatment, is only um, getting stronger and stronger and it, um, it's blowing almost everything else out of the water. So if you have a disease that you are treating, um, you can almost certainly include exercise prescription as a way to treat that disease or to stop it getting worse and you'll be correct based on the evidence. So um, this is a graph from one of my favourite systematic reviews, but there's many on the topic, um, or, or the chart, and this is... Um, exercise and all cause mortality. And every chart you see from a systematic review is going to, is going to have this shape to it, which is that if you do uh, about 20 to 30 minutes per day of moderate or vigorous, vigorous physical activity, you will get an over 50% um, um, reduction in all cause mortality. So you will reduce your risk of dying compared to someone who's sedentary and not exercising at all by 60%, which is mind blowing, um, that that exercise is um, at a level where it's almost as good um, as a specific risk factor as being a non-smoker versus being a smoker. And certainly much better than the risk factor for being normal body weight versus overweight um, and many of the other big risk factors that we think about. So being a non-exerciser is extremely bad for your health and being an exerciser at moderate or vigorous level is um, very good for your health. Um, it's controversial about whether, um, how much or whether there is a, a, a reversal of the beneficial effect if you get to extreme levels of exercise. So you'll notice this curve is not an L shape, it's like a reverse J. So um, according to this particular graph on this systematic review, there's a little bit of an upstroke towards the end. Um, the people who are doing more than an hour of moderate or vigorous physical activity per day, um, appear to have not quite the same benefit as the people who are doing a medium amount, but they're still getting a much um, better um, result than people who are doing no exercise. And you'll also notice that the um, error bars, standard deviations are much higher as you go to the very right hand side of the graph. Um, so interesting discussion point is, is there a, a, a point at which exercise becomes harmful and too much for you? Um, really interesting topic. But the benefits of moderate exercise are unbelievably good. And this is the case. Um, so this is a chart showing that now, you know, and this one's actually about 10 years old, this graph. Um, and um, it, inactivity would have surged ahead. But even 10 years ago, it was calculated that inactivity as a risk factor was responsible for more global deaths per year than smoking. Um, it will have surged ahead now because the rates of smoking are dropping um, and the rates of inactivity are going up. So inactivity is now... Um, almost the number one um, risk factor for disease that's reversible um, that we can attribute to disease. Um, and the reason why it is so good at um, all-cause mortality prevention is that if you name all of the major conditions that um, kill us or that present to general practice, um, um, and I haven't even got COVID up here, but um, and you probably don't want to talk much about COVID because you're probably sick of it, but there's, there was actually, a, I, didn't, I should have put this up as a slide, but there was a, a, a systematic review showing um, that uh, COVID death rates are far lower if you're physically active compared to if you're inactive. So exercise is a preventer of death from COVID. Um, it prevents um, and treats cardiovascular disease. It prevents and treats cancer, which is mind blowing, but it's absolutely established now, um, particularly the major ones where there's lots of data like breast and bowel cancer and it probably extends to all cancer. It um, protects um, against depression and treats depression. 
which is our major mental health problem, um, pre um, prevents and treats diabetes and obesity. Musculoskeletal pain, it certainly can be used as a treatment and it is um, protective in moderate doses, but there is a dose response curve with respect to musculoskeletal pain and protects um, against osteoporosis and falls in the elderly. So um, you list all of the major chronic diseases in Australia and causes of death and exercise is beneficial for all of them, which is why you get such a great um, global effect on all cause mortality. So that's great news. Um, the bad news with respect to musculoskeletal and sports medicine is um, that almost everything else has been downgraded to either borderline or useless or even harmful. So we, we get better and better reps on exercise and all of the other things that I used to do a lot of, I'm doing a lot less of. Um, Non-steroidals, um, harmful in terms of increasing cardiovascular events. Um, other painkillers, particularly opioids, um, worse than harmful, possibly the worst um, disaster in the history of medicine. Um, the opioid epidemic, which started from um, USA, but is rife here. Um, we have you know, 15 times the opiate prescriptions today than we had um, 20 years ago, and uh, all causing net harm. Um, Short-term pain relief, which you know, moves quickly to no pain relief, um, and most quickly to addiction and massive amount of death associated with the addiction. Um, a lot of orthopedic sur surgery is also borderline or harmful. Um, there are some um, nice exceptions and some where the jury's still out. Hip and knee replacements are probably good operations in um, um, proper patient selected groups. Um, fracture fixation remains good. There might be some others, but a lot of orthopedic surgery is in the gun as potentially unhelpful and maybe harmful. Um, we have an explosion of imaging, um, but a lot of the imaging leads to unnecessary panic in patients. Um, allied health, where it's exercise-based, is excellent, but like sports and exercise medicine, um, can do harm. And um, there's a lot of um, you know, placebo-type treatments done in allied health that are essentially scaremongering that tell people that their alignment's out or that they um, you know, need to come back and get adjusted week after week after week. Um, and uh, doesn't do a lot other than um, you know, foster repeat uh, visits. So sadly, there's not a lot of other good news apart from the power of exercise, but there's a lot of good news. And I do want to include this slide and I'll have to race through it for time purposes but it almost exploded. So I tried to think, well, what do we know in medicine is really, really good and helps people? And this slide should keep you um, a little bit optimistic as a GP that there's so much in medicine that's proven beneficial. And if you look at medicine as a profession as a whole, there is a lot more um, um, good than harm. So even though I'm about to slag off on a lot of musculoskeletal medicine, um, um, you know, running through the list, vaccines, contraception, IVF, um, antibiotics used appropriately, statins, defibs, adrenaline phenylaxis, asthma medication, public health, general practice itself, emergency medicine itself, um, obstetric and perinatal care, cancer care, psychotherapy, um, a lot of the ophthalmological um, surgeries are good, endocrinology's got some great hormones it prescribes, uh, um, um, etc. So there's a lot of things in medicine that really work and make being a GP rewarding because you are helping people um, and you've got to balance this up against the potential harm in some areas of medicine. Um, and I don't want to pick on obstetrics and gynaecology, but I, I put this slide up to show that it's not about some doctors being heroes and other doctors being villains. It's just about what the data shows. So in ONG as a specialty, you can have the biggest success story if you, you know, I mean, you'd argue over what's the biggest success story in medicine, but one of them has to be the decline in child mortality over the last hundred years, which is absolutely enormous and which pediatricians take some benefit or some, some credit for. Public health takes a lot of credit, um, particularly vaccination and obstetric and perinatal care takes a huge amount of um, credit for. So you give it, the obstetric profession a huge rep for that, but then in their work as gynecologists, they've given us transvaginal mesh, which has been an unmitigated disaster. Um, um, and um, a lot of the elective gynecological procedures, I'm skeptical about endometriosis, so I won't get into it, but um, um, you know, well, there's some great good in obstetrics and there's some, some very dubious um, 
um, procedures in gynaecology um, in the same profession. So it's not like I'm trying to promote that there are good doctors and evil doctors. It's just that there are evidence-based procedures that um, work when you look at the data and those that don't work. And um, we're stuck a little bit on bioplausibility, um, but you can't argue with the data when you've got enough of it. Um, and then I've put up an, a, what, I, what I've called the terrible trio, um, which is musculoskeletal pain, obesity, and depression. And um, they are, I can group them all together because they're all, um, they're all areas where medicine is losing in terms of what we offer patients is not getting good results. So musculoskeletal pain is increasing, obesity is increasing, and depression is increasing. And that's despite what medicine is offering. Um, it may be that other factors that are outside the control of medicine are causing the increases, um, but um, we are not fixing the problem. Um, and the three of them, unfortunately, are very linked in that it's often in the same patients. So um, people who get bad musculoskeletal outcomes often put on weight and often become depressed. And, um, um, and so they're very linked. I'm not going to talk a lot about obesity and depression, but I'm going to talk a lot about musculoskeletal pain. Um, but we have to be not godlike and look at all of the wins we've had in medicine, all the things that we can really help for and be proud of. And we have to be um, humble about the things that we don't go well with and look at um, what is the best um, plan of action where you don't have the magic bullet that everyone's looking for. And these are three, um, probably the top three areas where we don't have the magic bullets. Um, this is a list from my own college's, um, um, what do you call it, our syllabus or our um, what you're meant to learn for your exams in training. These are the things about me that you're meant to know about. And um, it's a long list. And you look at that list and it's pretty scary if you're a GP thinking, oh my God, I haven't even heard of some of them. And they're the ones that we're meant to be experts on as sport and exercise med physicians. The more modern um, version of that list that I gave to registrars and we'll talk about me and um, this is where a lot of these next few slides come from is that a lot of them actually we're, we're moving into the degenerative category anyway so um, a lot of knee is knee arthritis and uh, and pre-arthritis if it's not frank arthritis and so from my point of view arthritis is an osteoarthritis is not a dirty word it's something that you will have if you get to middle age and beyond and it's a key concept that all doctors should understand and we should educate and all patients should understand. And it's not a disaster if you get a scan showing arthritic and degenerative changes because you will have that by virtue of your birth certificate once you reach middle age onwards. So um, see most knee diagnoses as degenerative knee problems, see most shoulder diagnoses as degenerative shoulder problems, see most hip diagnoses as degenerative hip problems. And um, it's a good starting point and encourage patients to not panic. These changes on scans will appear as they age. And the key to managing musculoskeletal pain well is to, be, is to behave like the group that doesn't get a lot of pain. Everyone will get some musculoskeletal pain as they age. You've got to look to the behavioral patterns of people who don't get much musculoskeletal pain and avoid the behavioral patterns of people who get a lot of musculoskeletal pain. You can't fight against gravity. Um, the musculoskeletal system from a structural point of view is going downhill. The only fight you can win is to behave in a fashion that you don't get um, riddled with pain. So it, it, that's the key concept for the entire talk really, um, that we treat musculoskeletal um, problems in sports and exercise medicine functionally, not structurally. Um, structure is related to your age more than anything else. Um, function you can do something about. Um, so stats on arthritis is that um, if you look at a joint like a knee, um, half the population on x-ray will have OA of their knee if you just do a random x-ray, even on asymptomatics um, in the elderly. Um, and if you're talking MRI degenerative changes, that's the entire population over 65 and the majority over 40. Um, but if you talk about clinical osteoarthritis, people who say they've got a disability and their life is impacted by osteoarthritis, it's um, slightly more in women than men um, and, a, and a really decent percentage. Um, this is an old slide, so it's probably gone up. I reckon it's, it would have gone up by now. But um, a key point is that um, most people who have radiological osteoarthritis don't have the clinical syndrome of osteoarthritis. Um, and that's the key question. As you age, 
you will not succeed being a, trying to be the person who has no changes on your imaging. You will get those changes. You can only succeed by being the person who is not crippled by the clinical syndrome of osteoarthritis. So don't fight the structure, fight the function. Um, so over your lifespan, you, your structure is going to get worse and worse um, and your function you can hopefully preserve. And we all should aspire to be the, the 70 year old, the 75 year old, the 80 year old who goes for a walk every day and is still doing something, still going down and playing lawn bowls or having a hit of golf or um, going swimming a few laps um, and, and moderately active and not complaining about pain, mentioning, oh yeah, my back's not great, my hip's not great, my my neck, my knee's not great, my neck's not great, my shoulder's not great, but it sort of doesn't really affect my life. That's the 70 year old or 80 year old we all need to aspire to be. And there is a formula to get there and I'm gonna give you the formula and it's what I give almost all of my patients um, who are presenting with musculoskeletal problems, the majority of which are related to degeneration in the musculoskeletal system. Um, so, um, another way I put it in the Australian term is you need to learn how to stuff your joints up and then to not do it. So um, you need to know the pathway to failure and you don't take that pathway. And if you don't take the pathway to failure, you'll accidentally be walking the pathway to success. Um, so um, if, you, um, if you have a job, including professional sport, where you absolutely smash your musculoskeletal system. So you play professional NRL or you work as a coal miner or a baggage handler at the airport um, or um, a furniture removalist. Yes, you will get premature degeneration of the musculoskeletal system. Um, but you actually get more problems if you are completely sedentary, um, which is um, you know very, very interesting. So either end of the extreme is a way to, to um, destroying your musculoskeletal system. And the, of the two ways to destroy it, destroy it with overuse rather than underuse. They're both bad um, for the musculoskeletal system, rampant overuse, but rampant under, underuse is even worse because it not only destroys your musculoskeletal system, it destroys all of your other systems as well. Um, in terms of knee, if you've had any knee surgery ever, um, particularly knee arthroscopy, but also ACL reconstruction, um, if a surgeon has opened your knee and cut in for any reason whatsoever, you have an increased risk of functional knee osteoarthritis um, and of getting knee pain later on in life. So um, the message from this is if you can avoid knee surgery, avoid it at all costs. <laughs> um, you, you, the, the, the knee surgeons have had an exploding amount of work because um, people have been sucked into this structural paradigm of, oh, this, you've got a, a structural problem, we need to correct it like a car mechanic corrects some um, problems in the car engine. Um, and the problem is knee surgery just leads to more knee surgery. So if there is a surgical option and there is a non-surgical option and you can take the non-surgical option, you should take the non-surgical option um, with respect to knee. We've got great data to say you, you, you let the surgeon in once and you are increased risk of having a knee replacement down the track because your knee will deteriorate functionally. If you've had cortisone injections or use painkillers, it's the, it's, it's the same thing, just as bad. You, you have a cortisone injection and it increases the chance you're going to have a knee replacement and it increases the chances that the knee replacement won't go as well. Um, and painkillers um, are, are all bad as well. non steroids and opiates are also bad and we should avoid them. Sometimes we can't avoid them at all times, but we should avoid them as much as possible. So if you avoid cortisone injections, avoid painkillers, avoid knee surgery, and avoid rampant overuse and rampant underuse, um, you, you're likely to have a worn out knee on imaging as you age, but a knee that's functionally pretty good that you cope well with and you won't have to have a knee replacement. Um, so the data on this, um, this is from a systematic review of running, which looked at um, um, a moderate social, light to moderate social runners versus competitive runners and competitive athletes and the sedentary and there was a 15% risk of arthritis in the competitive runners, a 4% um, in the social runners, and an 11% in the control. So um, both not running at all or running um, at um, elite or um, competitive level led to increased risk of hip and knee OA 
and running the way to solve it and not have hip or, or knee OA was to run at social level. And I'll come back to that meta-analysis again. Um, so what does the traditional medical pathway offer? All the things I just told you to not do, that's what we do in medicine. It's, it, it, it sounds insane, but we, we offer knee surgery, we offer knee arthroscopy, we offer ACL reconstruction, we offer painkillers, we offer cortisone injections, and we're also dealing with um, uh, our lifestyle factors that are pushing us towards more, um, um, you know, sedentary behaviour, which is, is, as I said, is worse than, you know, people did more manual work 50 years ago and they had better knee outcomes. So it's not um, manual work and excessive manual work that's destroying our knees. And it's not the tiny percentage of the population that's playing professional rugby league. Um, it's the increasing percentage of the population that's completely sedentary that's um, that's the lifestyle factor that's um, making our joints worse. So, um, um, and, and, you know, there's less encouragement to do moderate sport. Those who do play sport, there's encouragement to be very competitive about it. Um, and, and so we're, we're, you know, peeling off at the extremes where there's a lot of the population that doesn't do any exercise and a lot that plays competitive sport and not enough that moderately exercise. The pandemic, ironically, was somewhat helpful for, um, increasing the amount of moderate exercise. So people who didn't have to do their daily commute started going for a bit of a walk and, and that was a really good habit um, that did come out of the pandemic. Um, knee replacement in Australia, um, two graphs that don't exactly link. One was 1991 to 2006 and one was 2002, so a slide over to 2021. I see disaster here. Um, I see an eight to tenfold increase in 30 years of knee replacements in Australia. And um, the orthopedic surgeons don't see disaster. They see extra work and um, earning a million dollars a year rather than half a million dollars a year and um, paying off their third holiday home. And that's me talking cynically. Um, I see um, an unmitigated medical disaster that, um, yes, there were probably people in 1991 who needed a knee replacement that didn't have access and access has improved. But there's no way that seven out of eight people who needed a knee replacement in 1991 couldn't get it. And we're now finally catching up and giving everyone access. Knee arthritis has gotten a lot worse in 30 years and a lot more people um, are needing knee replacements now in Australia because there's a lot more people with very, very painful knees. Um, and the rate is accelerating. And um, it's a bad graph that we should be ashamed of and we should be talking more of. Um, um, this is um, a group that looked at projections and thought it's just going to get even higher and higher because it just seems to be going up with no stop. And the answer is more orthopedic surgeons. We don't have enough orthopedic surgeons because we just have to do more and more hip and knee replacement. So we've got to you know, steal from other um, you know, specialties and train more orthopedic surgeons because we um, can't keep up with all the hip and knee replacements. So, I mean, I look at that. I, I understand where that paper comes from, but I, it makes me want to bang my head against the wall and say, hang on a second shouldn't we be trying to prevent the knee replacements and prevent the hip replacements? And then we don't need more um, orthopedic surgeons. We need more um, health professionals who can help prevent um, the hip and knee replacements because it's not rocket science as to how to prevent it. Um, but, you know, if you just sort of say, we'll not change anything in our health system, then the numbers are going to keep going up. So um, we're on projection. We haven't turned it around to just increase it. And it's not a good, it's not a good um, look. Um, Australia also, any graph you pull out that looks at world figures, Australia is at the top or right near the top. Um, and I'm, you know, I get a bit cynical and sort of say, did we manage COVID well or manage it badly? Well, in 2020 and 2021, we manage it well because we have less deaths. And that's ultimately, you've got to be your goal. Is it good to have high infant mortality or low infant mortality? It's good to have low infant mortality. Is it good to have high teenage suicides or low suicides? It's good to have low suicides. Is it good to have higher rates of knee replacement or low rates of knee replacement? I think that's a no brainer. It's good if we have low rates of knee replacement. What is Ireland and Portugal and Poland and Israel doing down the bottom of that chart that Australia is four or five times higher than? These are not countries that are, maybe Mexico is, is um, unbelievably low. And, and maybe you could look at Mexico and say, this is that they don't have enough orthopedic surgeons and there's people who aren't getting their, their knee pain treated. Um, maybe Mexico and Chile are outliers um, because they don't have enough availability of end stage treatment, but we have way, way higher rates of knee replacement than Ireland, Portugal, Poland, Israel, 
um, New Zealand, Italy, Norway. Um, what is going on that we have such an enormous rate compared to these other countries? There are some other countries that are really high up with us, but, um, but it's not a good look that we're so much higher than most of the other OECD countries. And the WHO and OECD have called us out on it. Um, so this is, um, um, you know, um, Australian Quality and, and um, um, Safety Commission mentioning that we've been called out by the OECD as having a much higher rate than comparable countries. For knee replacement, what are we doing about it? The answer is we're not. We're just sitting by and letting it accelerate. Um, I missed a slide there, but it's probably showing the same thing. I think there was another one showing Australia topping um, all countries in another look. And this is a, a paper from New Zealand uh, looking at, at um, increased lifetime prevalence. So even New Zealand, a country that's doing relatively well compared to Australia, they are seeing lifetime risk of, of knee replacement and hip replacement go up. And these numbers are much lower than what we get in Australia. So in Australia, the lifetime risk of hip and knee replacement are over 20% now, which is um, extraordinary because it's a gen in a generation that's gone through the roof. It was less than 10% um, a, a generation ago, and now it's more than 20%. Um, it's not a good outcome. Um, the, the only snippet of good news is that knee arthroscopy has started to drop, um, but the first study showing that knee arthroscopy did not beat placebo surgery was published in 2002. And um, we've, we've increased since that study where knee arthroscopy failed to beat placebo, and there's been about another six of them that have been done since. And in all of them, knee arthroscopy doesn't beat placebo surgery. So that's surgery, not just physio, but surgery where you put, uh, put the patient under anaesthetic and you just put some incision holes and don't let the surgeon in. The placebo group does just as well as the surgery group. Um, there's been about six of those trials. And um, we've now dropped the knee arthroscopy rate back to what it was in the early 2000s. But in Australia, it's still over 30,000 knee arthroscopies a year. And essentially, we don't have any evidence to support um, any of them. Um, the surgeons will say, oh, uh, lavage and an infected joint or removable of, an, of a loose body. There's a couple of um, um, unlocking a bucket handle tear that's locked. These are rare scenarios that maybe knee arthroscopy is still um, justified in, but the vast majority of the knee arthroscopies, the 30,000 of them that are still done annually in Australia are done on degenerative knees and all of the evidence is that it only worsens degenerative knees if they get a knee arthroscopy. Um, if you get a knee arthroscopy, you definitely increase the risk of um, having a knee replacement and for all ages, um, the risk of having it within two years is 7.5%. And the risk, if you're over 65, you have a knee arthroscopy, that you've got a 22% chance of having a knee replacement after a knee arthroscopy. And if you have a knee arthroscopy compared to controls with the same level of arthritis, you have a three times higher rate of going on to knee replacement. So um, entering the knee the first time for the surgeon increases by threefold the chances that the surgeon will be required back to do a knee replacement. Um, cortisone, the data is looking almost as bad. Um, if you cortisone versus a placebo injection in, in a double-blinded RCT, there's more cartilage regeneration. If you use cortisone, uh, it, you're more likely to deteriorate in, in cohort design follow-up studies. Um, there's no benefit um, beyond about eight weeks in any of the RCTs that are placebo or controlled with another injection type. And um, um, a, um, cohort match people have radiological deterioration if they're followed, those who use cortisone compared to those who didn't use cortisone. And um, there's one study, which is a cohort study from 2020, showed that each cortisone injection increased the risk that you will need a knee replacement by 9% at nine years follow-up compared to those who are matched to your severity who didn't get a cortisone injection. So if you want to get someone towards a knee replacement, you give them a cortisone injection. Um, and um, if you have cortisone in the lead up to a knee replacement, you've got more chance that a knee replacement will go badly and more chance that your knee replacement will get infected. So it's all bad news for cortisone in the knee joint, um, other than you might get a transient benefit of two to four weeks in, in pain that drops you about one out of 10 on average on the pain scale, um, which is a tiny transient benefit for a whole lot of harm, worse cartilage degeneration, 
accelerated X-ray degeneration, increased risk of a knee replacement, and increased risk that your knee replacement won't go well. Um, um, ACL reconstruction is a better operation. Um, there are still definitely some people who are indicated to have ACL reconstruction, but we do too many of them in Australia. And there are now two large RCTs. This was the first of them showing that um, um, at least half the people who um, are randomised to non-surgical get as good a result in non-surgical as if they have the ACL reconstruction. And the half that don't do as well or that want to cross over um, don't have any downside of having a delayed ACL reconstruction versus an acute one. So in Australia, we tend to give people acute ACL reconstructions and two really strong RCTs show that um, it's better management to delay to say, don't have an ACL reconstruction straight away. Um, wait and see what your knee's like, you know, six months, 12 months, 18 months down the track. And if you still don't like the way your knee is, you can have a delayed reconstruction. You don't need to have an acute one with maybe the exception of professional elite athletes, et cetera. Um, um, and two really strong studies showing the same thing. We do too many of these operations, but I wouldn't say that this is an operation that should be killed off, which knee arthroscopy almost should be. Um, so most of our treatment that we offer in the medical system and we fund in the medical system is harmful. Um, and when you group all this together, it's no surprise that um, our outcomes are worsening because we are doing a lot of harmful care that itself is linked to worsening outcomes. We can't then see it as being a mystery as to why we're getting increased rates of knee replacements when all of the treatment that the medical system funds and tends to offer is harmful. So, um, um, and I've written, this was from, I think, 2017, an editorial. I've written quite a lot of pieces like this, but 2017 editorial, after Donald Trump got elected, we liked using the, the terms post fact and fake news and alternative news. Um, and um, we criticised the anti-vaccination movement for relying on alternative facts. But um, unfortunately, a lot of our orthopedic surgeons and rheumatologists rely on alternative facts. They, they say that it's good to get a cortisone injection or good to get an arthroscopy, which is just completely contrary to the evidence. Um, um, and we fund the things that we know are harmful and don't fund um, the thing that we know is beneficial, which is exercise um, treatment. So um, our funding model is partly to blame and the practitioners are partly to blame. Um, so we need a paradigm shift. The structural paradigm is harmful, the inflammatory paradigm. So the structural paradigm of the surgeons is harmful, the inflammatory paradigm of the rheumatologists is harmful. The biomechanical misalignment paradigm of our allied health isn't particularly useful. The pain-based paradigm of the pain specialist is harmful because it leads you towards opiates. The only paradigm that works that is helpful is the functional paradigm or the exercise um, paradigm, which hopefully most of my colleagues in sports and exercise medicine, most of the good physiotherapists, most of the good exercise physiologists follow. And this needs to be the new paradigm for the majority of not only knee presentations, but musculoskeletal presentations in general. Um, so um, um, obviously I've made my argument quite strongly. I'm really happy to, to discuss anyone who's got a problem with it in um, Q and A at the end. Um, I'll put up this slide really briefly. Um, this one is a, is, is a really tough one because we've been taught that we shouldn't be too paternalistic and we shouldn't be too compliant. So we shouldn't be massive opiate prescribers because patients just walk in and say, please write me a script for endone and give me another one for Valium and give me another one for dexamphetamine. Um, we need to not be compliant doctors, but we shouldn't be paternalistic doctors and wag the finger and say, I think you should have this and you must have this. We should be consultative doctors that talk to patients about pluses and minuses of things and let them make the choice with autonomy. But I sometimes wonder whether we need to move back to paternalistic to say, do not have an arthroscopy. The evidence is um, that it is unhelpful um, because plenty of patients will make their way to an orthopedic surgeon, get a knee arthroscopy recommended. And then if you sort of say, oh, well, you've heard the pluses and minuses from the surgeon and you can make the choice and go ahead. That's why we've still got the 30,000 still happening. Maybe more of us need to say you should not have knee arthroscopy and the medical system shouldn't fund it. Um, and we should be more paternalistic when we've got such strong data that something is harmful. Um, so um, what do you do when all of our traditional medical treatments don't work? Um, the answer is 
you move people towards what I call the Goldilocks zone of not too much and not too little. So for the people who are inactive, the absolute treatment is to increase your physical activity slowly, not rapidly, slowly, starting with gentle walking and increasing your walking. And for the people who are too active, who are 50 years old, 60 years old, 40 years old, 70 years old, 35 years old, who are training like they're still elite athletes or think they're elite athletes and say, well, I, I've got knee pain and I'm trying to break an hour for the city to surf or I'm trying to break three hours for the marathon or I, um, you know, I'm trying to, I'm playing um, B grade um, over 35 soccer and I want to get up to A grade because um, I think I can win the premiership in A grade and I don't like the fact that my knee hurts. Um, that group is the better, is the preferred group for me to work with, but some people have got to hear the stuff that they don't want to hear, just like a, a, a football player doesn't want to hear at 33, you know, we're not going to give you another contract because you used to be the fastest player on the team and now you've slowed down a bit and we've got other younger players who are actually going to be better than you and we now aren't going to recontract you. It's not nice news. It's not nice for people to hear where you want to keep running the city to surf at under you know 60 minutes and you want to keep playing your master soccer and not have any knee pain and you want to keep playing um, a grade tennis and not have any shoulder pain maybe your body's not going to let you do it at that level you can still be active and you still should be active but you might not stay 25 for the rest of your life a lot of people don't want to hear that but they need to hear it because if they go down the track of saying painkillers cortisone injections um, arthroscopic surgery they will be the ones that will head down towards worse outcomes if they can move themselves into the Goldilocks zone, either from not doing enough to doing a moderate amount of exercise or doing too much exercise because they're getting pain into doing moderate exercise, they can avoid um, getting the worst musculoskeletal outcomes as they age. Um, so my most important technology of the last 10 years is um, fitness wearables. I love them and I use them for almost all of my patients and insist that if they don't have one, it can be just their mobile phone, of course, if their mobile phone's on them, but I want to know what are their loading patterns and how can they tweak them to get better outcomes. So I'm constantly talking to people about their Fitbits and their Garmin's and their iPhones and their Samsung apps, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I wish we had an upper limb and a low back um, um, load monitor like we have a lower limb load monitor. Um, but that's what I spend a lot of time with my patients talking about when I'm talking to them about why they shouldn't have a cortisone injection, they shouldn't have knee surgery. I'm talking to them about how they should be looking at their wearables and measuring what their loads are. Um, so to finish on knee and to move on to another topic, which I'm sure you're glad that I'm gonna move on to another topic. Um, most of what we used to do and what we still do and what we fund are wrong. And we need to exercise moderately and move all of our patients towards exercising moderately to get better outcomes. And this works not only for me, but for everything else, which I'll now move on to. Um, and this is back to me and I won't talk too much about, but again, this is me 2010 running a half marathon. And this is me yesterday. I did a, um, a 5K run and Decent pace, I'm still going okay. But I didn't run today because I'm, I'd am i be too sore to run today. That's, a, that's as fast as I can run now. Um, and um, particularly as fast as I can run to avoid joint pain. And I had pretty stiff back and pretty stiff hips and pretty stiff knees today, having done a 5K run yesterday. So I might do another one Friday, Saturday, um, and I'll do my, haven't walked enough steps today. So I might even get out and do some at nine o'clock tonight to sort of get myself up a bit. Um, um, and I'm drinking less alcohol. I'm monitoring my alcohol, drinking less alcohol to try to stay in that Goldilocks zone for alcohol consumption as well. And I've got, I'm sure on X-ray and on MRI, I'd have hip arthritis and knee arthritis and I haven't had any MRIs or any X-rays and I don't want to have any because I don't want to know about it. I want to just keep doing what I can do and I've accepted what I can't do, what I could do. I'd love to still be running a half marathon and I've accepted I can't because I'm a bit older um, and I've accepted that I've got wedding glasses and I'm pissed off with them as well. Um, so the main difference when you get to soft tissue is there's a little bit more blue sky in that some of the soft tissue problems are reversible, whereas joint degeneration is not reversible. But things like plantar fasciitis and tennis elbow and Achilles tendinopathy are somewhat reversible. And if you have a true soft tissue problem that doesn't involve a joint, you might be able to 
get it cured with it's the same management avoid cortisone avoid surgery avoid painkillers but if you load manage and go moderate um, in your loading you might be able to cure it rather than have to deal with it for the rest of your life so um so soft tissue is more pleasant than um than um arthritis and joint degeneration um, but it's as frustrating because it's you know, hard to give a prognosis as to how long soft tissue pain may last, much easier if you've got a pure muscle strain because that um, might be quite quick if you strain a hamstring or strain a calf. Um, but more, more musculoskeletal problems take longer than most people think. People see a footballer coming back after straining a calf three weeks later and getting away with it and thinking, why is my calf taking eight weeks? Um, but um, it's probably going to take longer than you think and you need to be gentler in your rehab than you realise. Um, but soft tissue, um, some blue sky that you might get a cure um, as opposed to the joints where you'll be living with them. Even if they're not hurting you, you'll be living with them for the rest of your life. Um, so plantar fasciitis or plantar heel pain, um, it's load management is the main management and that you should initially unload and then gradually build your loads back up um, and only use painkillers um, and you know cortisone injections if you absolutely have to realizing that there is sugar hit that is kicking the can down the road with respect to um, soft tissue problems um, less damaging in the long term for soft tissue problems than it is for joints um, maybe some of the other you know prp injections shockwave orthotics maybe they can help a little bit um, None of them are absolutely earth shattering. Um, they all have less harm than cortisone and surgery. Um, but load management is the treatment for 95% of people who have got soft tissue problems as well. Um, so you can aim to cure plantar fasciitis, which is good news. Um, and um, it's the same art, which as someone who does it all the time, I'm hopefully an expert on and very good and can help with the difficult cases. But if you learn the principles, you can learn um, to manage the easier cases. I, I have empathy for you in general practice. I only do long consults because it's really hard to do a short consult when you're talking about exercise because people will um, take a long time to give a good exercise history because you'll ask lots of questions about what they do all the time and how much they time they spend on it. And then they'll ask lots of questions. Why can't I have painkillers? Why can't I have an injection? Why, why shouldn't I have surgery? Why can't I get a scan? What does this scan finding mean, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's hard to do a short consult. And I appreciate that general practice is under massive pressure to do short consults. Um, so it's really hard to work in this area. Um, and I, um, I can only say if you are going to do it and you want to do it well, you make your consults longer and then you probably have to charge and, and abandon bulk billing a little bit because the government doesn't want to pay you for the longer consults. Um, so we talk with elite athletes about in-season versus off-season management. And um, this does apply to joints, but it sort of applies particularly to soft tissue problems. Um, for sports where you have a, a, an in-season and an off-season, you can sort of tolerate pushing through the pain a bit and try to get it better in the off-season. So someone who's, say, got a, a football player, a basketball or whatever, and who plays over winter and, and summers their off-season, you can say, yeah, you can keep going with this. This is safe. You probably won't throw this off during your competitive season and you're probably not going to not that many achilles tendon problems end up rupturing some of them do but it's pretty rare most ruptures come from nowhere or apparently nowhere and more ruptures are caused by underuse in the lead up rather than overuse in the lead up um, but um but you know if you can keep going it's safe to keep going if you have an off season coming up when you can rehab and then when you've got an off season then you unload and then gradually reload back up and avoid painkillers, do it at the pace that pain is allowing you to progress at and accept a little bit of pain in your upgrading of load. Um, the key question of how much pain to accept is, is the hard one to answer. Um, and the simple answer is, is encourage people to accept two or three out of 10 pain. Um, don't aim for zero out of 10 pain because then you'll never move. Um, but don't accept eight out of 10 pain. So hopefully if you unload, you can get pain from high to low or moderate and then accept low or moderate on the way back up um, as you increase your load. Um, and if you suddenly ramp it back up to high, then you stop your increase and maybe back off a little bit. Um, this is a, a, a slide on tennis elbow 
Um, one, it's an Australian study, which I love, and uh, it's been replicated by about five international studies um, showing that cortisone is bad for tennis elbow. Um, but it's interesting, it helps early. So this is um, a 2006 study from the BMJ. If you cortisone, you do better in the first four to six weeks compared to physio and wait and see. Um, and then at three months and six months and 12 months, cortisone is doing worse than doing nothing and worse than physio. So physio beats wait and see, although to be fair, you know, physio wasn't properly assessed in this trial in that it wasn't double blinded. So wait and see got told you're doing nothing for this. Um, and the group that had physio got a little bit more placebo response, but physio, fortunately for physio did better, but the cortisone group did better than both physio and doing nothing early. And they did worse than doing nothing at three months, six months and 12 months. Um, and that's been replicated in many other studies. So the evidence is that you shouldn't use cortisone for tennis elbow. Um, um, for tennis elbow, load management is more complicated. I love my, um, ironically, these wrist wearables are measuring lower limb load, not upper limb load. So this is one of the cricketers who I'm sure those who have watched cricket have seen this guy on TV who had tennis elbow and we kept an Excel spreadsheet for him um, measuring his batting load, um, his batting duration, intensity, duration, how much he did at the gym, how much he did at home with housework, um, how much pain he had, how many painkillers he, he needed to use, what his total load was for the day, amount of pain and, and complicated measures to say, how can we get his load up and his pain down-ish um, and getting back to full function. And he now is at full function. But this is the sort of thing I do with my patients who have got upper limb pain, who I'm giving specialist advice for, create some sort of an Excel sheet with them so they can um, manually measure their upper limb load because the wearables concentrate on lower limb load. Um, um, my, I love analogies. So you wanna be like in the middle there in Goldilocks. So I say to people go to the Goldilocks zone, which is the not too hot, not too cold. Don't be like this guy, don't be like this guy. Don't be Superman, don't be Clark Kent. Be somewhere between Superman and Clark Kent um, um, or Goldilocks middle there. They're not too hot, not too cold. Um, this is a, a chart that I love that I often draw for my patients. This is sort of a typical group that might enter a study for plantar fasciitis or, um, or um, tennis elbow or Achilles tendinopathy and you follow them up for six or seven months. And if all of your study participants will sort of tend to sort of fall into a whole lot of different groups where you'll have some people that get cured, which is fantastic. Some people will say that, you know, the, the, the six months been horrible. They might've got a bit better and they got worse again, or they never got better at all. And they're really unhappy. And some of them sort of say, yeah, I'm a bit better six months. And in fact, I'm not cured, but I'm a bit better. And yes, partially responding. Um, and, um, it's hard to get everyone into that cure group, but it's much easier for me as an expert now to predict who is going to be in that group and who is going to be in that group, who's going to be in the group of um, successful cases. And the successful cases are those who have used minimal drugs and surgery and who aren't smashing themselves and who aren't um, completely sedentary. The group that tends to, sorry, that's the group that fails. The group that's successful have loaded moderately and steadily and gradually and have avoided drugs and avoided surgery. Um, so learn how to fail. And if you don't do any of the pathways to failure, you might succeed. So if you, if you stay high, if you're an exercise addict or a, work in a worker in a high manual job and you don't unload at all, um, or a professional athlete or a new mother on maternity leave who just says, I can't, no one else is going to help me with this baby. I'm just changing nappies and rocking and, and, and pushing the stroller all day and my wrist is hurting and I can't stop it. If you um, um, have ongoing high load, you tend to not get better. The new mother is an interesting one because they're like um, um, athletes and you hopefully encourage them to eventually solve the problem, um, but accept a little bit of pain in season as the cost of being a new mother with no support. But you won't be a, a mother with a newborn forever. So eventually your wrist pain can get better, but it's hard to put up with it while it's not getting better. Um, if you are sedentary and a non-exerciser, and often these patients are overweight, obese and depressed, and often they're painfully dependent, and often they give excuses and they say, oh, but I've had a physio or a chiro tell me that I'm, you know, my hip's out or my core is weak or my 
disc is sort of out of alignment and um, I can't exercise because of that, or my surgeons told me I've got bone on bone, so I can't exercise, or I've had a scan and I've got a disc that's prolapsed and I'm not allowed to do any exercise. Um, you've got to cut through that rubbish about not exercising. Not exercising is toxic for everyone and you've got to get them started and throw out the window any advice they've had, even from health professionals telling them that they can't exercise. And the other group that doesn't do well is the, uh, I've called them Oscillate Wildly, which was the name of a restaurant, but, um, um, you know, that they rest, 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 feel better, and then they resume normal activities as soon as they start to feel better and the pain comes back and then they stop and they rest, rest, rest. So this group is getting close to the correct outcome, but what they've got to do is to unload and then reload gradually, not reload rapidly. Um, and that group can do very well because they're close to getting it right. Um, um, then I'm going to have my rant on funding. Now that's the front cover from the BMJ when I write my article on plantar fasciitis, which hopefully you'll get a copy of um, um, in the um, adjunct handouts. Um, um, you know, I'm not having a crack at oncologists here, but when her septum came out, it was 100,000 per patient per year. And the government said, we've got to fund this because it leads to 30% improvement in survival in breast cancer. Um, so it's going to cost us $100,000 a year to fund, but we absolutely have to because it, it's 30% increase in survival. So we cannot not fund it. Um, exercise also leads to a 30% improvement in survival with breast cancer. And yet my specialty sports and exercise medicine is the only specialty in the history of Medicare to have had the consultation rebates cut and my patients get back less than they did 20 years ago. Um, and there's no sign of our rebates being increased to what they were, let alone to parity with other specialist physicians. Um, so, um, you know, a big pharma can lobby to get a super expensive drug that improves breast cancer survival funded because it's very emotive, but exercise is just considered something that we shouldn't fund not only by governments, but by other health professionals, by the AMA, um, that we shouldn't be funding exercise. So my specialty has had rebate cuts um, um, and therefore people come to see me, but they just pay most of the console out of pocket because it's not covered by Medicare, which is a pity. Um, so yeah, back to my Tesla. Um, don't want to have a further rant on fossil fuels, but we all know the story that governments fund fossil fuels and they don't fund renewable technology nearly as much as so. When I bought my Tesla, I paid luxury car tax. I didn't get a rebate from the government. I paid the government extra money for the privilege of owning an electric car. Um, we all know that that's not how it should be. The government should not be funding new gas fields and new coal mines, but they are because the political system's all stuffed up. Um, and we haven't been able to revolutionise it. Unfortunately, in some areas, the medical system does really, really well, but in other areas, the medical system is going very badly, and sadly, general practice is part of an area that's going very badly. Um, but if I press, um, um, you know, very similar slide, why is it that sports and exercise physicians only practice in wealthy areas? And this is true. There are no sports and exercise physicians effectively in the country or in low socioeconomic areas because there are no bulk billing sports and exercise physicians. Um, and the reason why um, is because Medicare doesn't fund us even to the level of GP consults. Um, and um, we know that the arthroscopy is bad. We know that a lot of the drugs are bad, but we fund them like opiates. We still fund opiates for, for knee pain and opiates for back pain when we know they're very, very harmful. We still fund them. We don't fund exercise medicine as a medical specialty. We don't properly fund physiotherapy, for example, um, and it's subsidising the wrong thing. And again, we need a bit of a revolution, which is why I've given you a bit of a rant on it today. Um, but just to sort of give you an idea of how um, lopsided this is, a knee arthroscopy takes less than 40 minutes to do, but the surgeon gets paid $500 to do it. The rheumatologist getting a, a long consultation of 45 minutes gets up to $230 for a chronic care consult. GPs, as you know, get about $90 for a 45 minute consult, which is not really sustainable if you're bulk billing um, once you've paid all of your staff and rent expenses. Um, chiropractors and physios get $55, so less than GPs. And, and, and as a result, most physios will charge out of pocket um, and it's hard to find a bulk billing physio. Um, um, sports and exercise medicine, 
most of our consults get $35 for a 40 minute consult. And I only do 40 minute consults because I talk a lot and I don't get results if I do short consults. Um, and, um, you know, just to twist the knife, in you know, a one minute consult with a rheumatologist or any other specialist physician gets a higher, re a much higher re Medicare rebate than a one hour consult with a sports and exercise med physician. So one hour of the room, one minute of the rheumatologist's time is valued at more than one hour of my time by the MBS at the moment. Um, there was a proposal in 2019 after a five year review to reform that and to give all specialists time tiered rebates a la GPs and to make them so that long consults got paid a lot for anyone, any specialist to use it and short consult got paid a little. Um, and the AMA lobbied to stop that happening backed by the College of Physicians and the College of Surgeons. So we really can't bulk bill anyone because we, you know, we're doing 40 minute consults with Medicare rebate being 35 bucks. Um, and we're not really welcome in the public health hospital system either. Um, and I'm getting very cynical to say, you know, does ortho and rheumatology not want us as part of the public system to preserve their profit base so they can keep doing their cortisone injections and their knee scopes? Um, we do do some adjunct treatments, which I'm, you know, lukewarm on, but they're what I do if I can't just do exercise. None of them are covered by Medicare either. Um, um, but exercise itself is proven to be beneficial for all our major diseases, and we're not allowed to charge, we're not allowed to be part of the chronic care scheme under Medicare either. So unfortunately, um, we, we operate effectively outside the Medicare system. Um, we still make a decent amount of money from our practice because people are prepared to pay on wealthy areas. We just don't venture to non wealthy areas, which is, which is enough to give you depression if, you, if you're thinking about equality for the community. But we can't literally go out and work for nothing um, working in low socioeconomic areas when, when our bulk billing rates are far lower than GP bulk billing rates. Um, so I won't make any comment on um, the logos I've put up there, but you know, um, just like curing climate change, curing um, bad funding models in medicine is a matter of who is supported by what. Um, and with your referral patterns and who you pay your memberships to, you can be members of bodies that are promoting exercise and not promoting bad musculoskeletal treatments, or you can um, join and refer to and promote bodies that do promote bad musculoskeletal treatments. And I hope that eventually there'll be permit pressure on the bodies that are promoting bad treatments to eventually stop, just like there'll be pressure on fossil fuel companies to, to stop um, destroying the planet. Um, so yeah, we can't change all this overnight and I'm still much more optimistic about medicine as a whole, um, but on, you know, musculoskeletal medicine needs to be blown up and rebuilt. Um, and um, exercise is the saviour, which um, yes, I'm a bit biased and maybe I would say that, but I reckon I've got a lot of data to back me up. So I'll finish there um, at about an hour and um, move to Q&A and um, hopefully, um, you found that um, stimulating, even if you might not have agreed with all of it. So I'll stop sharing the screen and you'll get a nice photo of Peter back up there. And I'll start looking at what's appeared on the um, 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 Q&A screen so I can um, read these out in turn. And they're not coming up for me. Um, what, why am I not seeing Q&A? Um, maybe, maybe Peter can read them out yeah, for I'll, me. I'll, I'll, I'll go through those uh, with you, John. Yeah, okay. Which, thank you very much for a fascinating uh, uh, presentation. Look, I, I can't remember who it was that said uh, half of the things that we do in medicine are wrong. It's just that we don't know which half. Well, maybe after your presentation tonight, we'll have a better idea of, of which half. So thank you for, uh, as I say, a fascinating uh, uh, presentation. The first question that I must ask you is, do you have any orthopaedic surgeon friends? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and um, I would say as friends, um, definitely social acquaintances, none of my best friends are orthopods, but um, um, yeah, I, I mean, I have to send... Um, elite athletes to orthopedic surgeons. So um, it's not that I never use orthopedic surgeons. So I've got a good working um, relationship with um, many orthopedic surgeons. And um, yeah, maybe some of them wouldn't like me saying knee arthroscopies almost in its death throes. Um, but um, I sort of, I, I'm, I rant enough on Twitter that people um, probably know what my views are. And 
most of the surgeons deep down, uh, the, 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 I, I'm not sure whether it was Osler who said that thing about we don't know which half is yeah, the better. I, I think it medicine. was, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, yeah. The, the other one is um, is Upton Sinclair, who said he's a politician, not a doctor, who said um, um, it's very hard for a person to understand um, how something works if their income is reliant on them not understanding it. That's another great quote. So if you. <laughs> It's it's hard to interpret the um, systematic reviews about knee arthroscopy if your income depends on you continuing to perform knee arthroscopy. So that's that's um, a cynic's view, but probably very true, and probably very true about the fossil fuel companies. If you work for for BP or Shell or um, Woodside Petroleum, it's probably very hard to understand um, the link between um, fossil fuels and and planetary destruction. So. Um, but yeah, hopefully I've, I've given you a bit of the half that's um, not good and the half that can save us in musculoskeletal medicine. But it is um, now some other quotes that I can't recall is that you know a lot of medicines you know doing um, you know doing nothing when you need meant to do nothing or whatever it is. Um, um, sometimes you can do too much and you should be doing less of you know and, and and exercise prescription is doing a lot less of intervention and encouraging people to get it right themselves. So. Um, but anyway, yeah, flick to one of the actual questions, which I still can't see. Okay. Um, no, that, that's, that, that's okay. As I said, I'll go through them with you. What you've just said there uh, leads me on to uh, one question that's been uh, asked in the Q&A, uh, which reads, is exercise advice in general practice based on common sense? And if we involve an exercise physiologist, how do we know that the program recommended is appropriate for their condition? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. Um, so um, I can comment on every single um, profession and including my own, because um, um, I think that there's not, you know, we're not all angels in sports and exercise and medicine, but exercise physiologists, um, the, the, the biggest positive is that exercise is the right treatment um, for most conditions and you will get exercise as part of your treatment. So they absolutely are the group that is most guaranteed to give you exercise as a treatment, which is fantastic. But um, not all of them understand dosing from a patient point of view. So the biggest criticism of exercise physiologists will be that some of them will be a bit like personal trainers and they'll have a performance hat on rather than a preservation hat on. So that's another really important concept that. Um, you know, if you're a personal trainer, people are often paying for personal trainers at the gym saying, I want to get stronger, I want to um, run faster, I want to be able to get a better time for the triathlon. And the trainer says, oh, okay, I'll help you train like an elite athlete and improve your performance. And there's a little bit of that in exercise um, physiologists in, in some of them. The really good ones will be able to say, Yes, this person is very frail, and I'm hardly going to offer them anything. Um, the other, the other thing about exercise physiologists, and it's the same with physios, etc., is um, that they um, potentially can um, foster dependence. So, um, if they say, "Well, you can only exercise if you're with me and doing it with me," um, then you'll have to come back to see me for ten visits. Um, and I, I prefer to not do any exercise with the patient, but to educate them on exercise and have them doing it because they are with themselves for 23 hours of the day, even if they're with me for an hour um, and they're with me only one day a week maximum rather than the other six days. So they spend 99% of their time not with me. So I feel like it's redundant for me to exercise with them, but exercise physiologists often will exercise with the patient when in fact, um, it should be more education. Um, so um, um, if you are getting an exercise physiologist who is hammering your patients and making them worse, then you should move around to other ones to, to see who's getting better results more often than not and maybe encourage the ones who are looking for a bit more of a push to do exercise physiology referrals and the ones that only need to look at a step counter to just say, you know what, your, your, your personal trainer is now your step counter, get your step counter, and you're currently doing 3,000 steps a day, let's work on getting you up to 4,000 steps a day. Okay, well, another question is with regard to exercise, how does your advice uh, regarding moderate to vigorous change with age? Yeah, well, the, the all-cause mortality stuff, um, the older you go, the more that vigorous is not harmful, which is really interesting. So, um, so um, 
um, as you age, um, you know, that the 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 over 60 group, um, the threshold at which you start to lose benefit is about seven or 8,000 steps. Um, and then if you include a younger cohort, um, you get benefit up to about 10,000 steps. So you, you, you certainly don't have um, um, any need to be doing vigorous, but, um, but you know, there's not as many people doing vigorous as you age. So, um, so anyone who wants to do vigorous and is not getting any negative effects is absolutely welcome to keep going. Um, but um, if you're talking about what you need for health, it's, it's as little as 7,000 steps for the elderly and only a bit more for the middle-aged and younger groups. Um, the reason why it's good to encourage more than just the minimum when you're younger is that it gives you the ability to slowly um, wind down as you age and you get more degenerative change. So I think it's better off to be a little bit more than the minimum when you're younger because you might get a sore back or a sore knee as you get older and need to reduce. And if you're only doing the minimum to start off with, um, it'll be hard to wind down from that. So I certainly encourage people to exercise as much as they can without hitting the pain threshold is, is probably a good way to put it. So the, the moderate exercise is good and anything above moderate that doesn't hurt you is good. Okay, another question is how can we break the pain cycle? How do we motivate our patients? Yeah, it's a really good question. And the answer is it's going to be different for, um, for everyone. Um, and it's a bit like the question of how do you, how do you stop someone who's an addict, um, um, which is really hard. And the answer is any way you bloody well can. Um, and, 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 you know, for different people, it, it might be different means. But um, if you, you know, there are some people addicted to exercise and it's causing them too much pain. And there are some people who are addicted to inactivity um, and who are fearful of exercise. And if, if a physio works, if an exercise physiologist works, if a sports and exercise med physician works, if a GP works, if just looking at education programs online works, whatever works, it's a bit like, how do you get someone to give up smoking? Um, any way you can, um, and you can try. You can just, if you know that that's what they've got to do, you can just keep rotating until you get the right answer. And if you're getting good results with a physio, stick with a physio. So some people um, prefer to have their hand held and to have it done with a physio, with an exercise physiologist. And some people prefer to get educated um, from a doctor who is just going to give them information and then allow them to process it. So um, it's whatever works for that particular patient, um, and. Um, you, another thing is that if something's got bad results like knee arthroscopy, you shouldn't see it as being like one of the cop outs for the surgeons now is even though the results are terrible in the RCTs, they say, oh, if conservative care fails, that's when you should do a knee arthroscopy. And the answer is if conservative care fails, try a different conservative care. Don't do knee arthroscopy because it's got no data to support it. Um, um, but, you know, conservative care has only failed in the, in, to the degree that it's been done, but you can do it a different way and keep chipping away at different angles. Um, if someone is, is um, only doing 3,000 steps a day and they've got knee pain, um, either you can, if they've really got no chance of getting better, you can do a knee replacement. But if you think this person doesn't look like they're in a knee replacement, but if they're only doing 3,000 steps a day and they say they can't do more because their knee hurts, it's a matter of how we're going to get them to do more um, and we're not going to operate on them and we're not going to load them up with painkillers. We're just going to try and find to try and get them to stumble on a, a time in their life when they feel like they can do more. But you've got to encourage them to monitor. And they probably don't want to monitor in the same sense that they don't want to stand on the scales. But monitoring is really good because you can say, okay, you're doing 3,000 steps a day. And unfortunately, Fitbit and Garmin don't help because they say you should be doing 10,000 or 15,000. Um, 3,000 is a number. And the nice thing is you're more likely to be able to get from 3,000, this is a good bit of optimism you can sell, you're more likely to be able to get from 3,000 steps a day to 6,000 steps a day than you are to be able to get from 95 kilograms to 75 kilograms. There's a lot of people that kid themselves that they think they can get from 95 kilograms to 75 kilograms and most of them will fail. But most people who are only doing 3,000 steps a day actually could get to 6,000 steps a day. Um, it might take them a while, but that's a much better chance of winning than dropping the 20 kilograms that they're trying to drop at the same time. I think this one's more of a comment rather than a question. It, it reads something along the lines of medicine being the art of keeping the patient occupied whilst nature takes its course. 
Yeah, that's um, that's a really good um, <clears throat> line. I do like it. And um, and my graph that I had before, I think it's, it's funny. Some of my Zoom is frozen, which is why I can't send the Q and A. But that graph, and I even I've even got a photo of myself frozen on this on my own screen. So um, for whatever reason, I'm I'm hearing Peter beautifully, and he's moving perfectly for me. But um, the the Art of letting nature take its course and keeping them occupied um, sums up how placebo treatments work. Um, what I like to, I mean, if you get surveys with, say, plantar fasciitis studies and, and the study involves asking people a year down the track, what do you think got your plantar fascia better? Um, um, a lot of people will say time. Um, and a lot of people will say, I don't know. And a lot of people will say, it just went away by itself. And a lot of people will nominate the last treatment they chose before they got better and just say, oh, it was my orthotics or it was my stretches that the physio gave me or it was um, um, some acupuncture I had. Um, and we, we, what I look at is who does get better. And so, you know, you can be nihilistic and say it either will get better randomly or it won't. And therefore, we should just be keeping them occupied with a diversion. Or you can say, we actually know which groups get better quicker and which groups don't get better. Um, and if you tell the patient how to not get better and they don't do how to not get better, then they might get better quickly. So um, I tell people, if you want to stuff this up, if you want to have a knee replacement, then get a cortisone injection or have a knee arthroscopy or start running an ultra marathon or sit in a chair and never leave it and do 1,000 steps a day. Um, here are the ways to stuff this up. And if you do none of them, um, you probably will gravitate towards getting better. Okay. Um, what, again, this is how the question reads, what is the effect of pro-inflammatory effect of strenuous exercise? Why do marathon runners and the like get atrial fibrillation? Yeah, it's a really interesting question and I, I love it. It's a fascinating topic. Um, um, my wife, who is Jessica Orchard, and you can you know, please feel free to follow her on Twitter. She's a researcher um, in, um, and one of her two big research themes is atrial fibrillation. So I've got a bit of expertise just um, um, sniffing around the research that she does. Atrial fibrillation is fascinating and whoever asked the question is very, very um, well read on it. The biggest group of people who get atrial fibrillation are the elderly inactive group. Um, and that group has a very elevated risk of stroke with atrial fibrillation and they should be treated both with encouragement to exercise, which may reverse their atrial fibrillation. But generally, um, if they don't get reversal very quickly, they should be treated with NOAX um, to anticoagulate them because that's proven to reduce their risk of stroke. The really interesting group is that intense exercises like marathon runners and rowers and cyclists have um, a, a, they're, they're a smaller subset of the atrial fibrillation group, but they do have an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. And surprisingly, they don't seem to have an increased risk of stroke that goes along with it. So it seems to be atrial fibrillation that's much more benign. So the beneficial effect of their exercise seems to counter any um, propensity towards getting a stroke. So it's, um, it's, the jury's much more still out about whether they should actually be treated with um, anticoagulation. Um, and whether they can um, get a reversal with moving from extreme exercise to moderate, and some of them don't want to, of course, um, or whether they could have some sort of ablation procedure to um, reduce their risk of, um, or, or, re or to revert their atrial fibrillation. So it's a really interesting topic, um, and you're dead right. And it, it, it feeds into this fascinating topic that we focus a lot on because it's so intellectually interesting, which is, is exercise in really high doses somewhat harmful compared to moderate exercise? And the answer is possibly, but in most facets for cancer prevention, it's um, yeah, there seems to be no upper limit for exercise. Yeah. For diabetes prevention, there seems to be no upper limit for exercise. Cardiac and musculoskeletal, there does seem to be a, um, a point at which the curve might tip upwards so that you might be um, some cardiac conditions like arrhythmias but cardiac deaths don't seem to tip up along with the arrhythmias, which is really interesting. John, there's a request for a list of exercise physiologists. Do you have uh, anywhere that uh, our GP colleagues could uh, go to to find such a list? Or uh, maybe uh, Lydia, the PHN might be able to uh, supply. Yeah, I agree. I think there'd be a huge list. And um, 
Um, and um, I think it's something that um, see exercise physiologists, because the importance of exercise as a GP, try to cultivate your own list as you'd cultivate a list in any other specialty. So just as you, you, you might have your three or four favourite cardiologists you refer to, um, you, you should see exercise physiology as an important part of your referral network that you have um, um, people that you cultivate. Um, so, yeah. I, I, I think the quest, questioner um, is implying that uh, exercise physiologists aren't uh, you know, necessarily plentiful um, and they're certainly not in uh, in every suburb like uh, GPs are. Is there somewhere that where they can go? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, we need more of them, and we particularly need more of them. The oncologists who are reading the literature and re realizing how um, it impacts on survival for most of the common cancers are pleading for exercise physiologists um, to work at the public hospitals and in oncology outpatients. So, um, yeah. Um, I, I would certainly look for lists. I don't have a list at hand, but I would look for lists and um, and um, try to um, um, increase your referral network there. And if the um, um, local body has got a list, uh, if really you can send a list to everyone. And and for some reason, my screen's unfrozen. I'm now seeing the questions, which is great. Um, um, you know, I'm absolutely happy to just have the slides distributed so that you can read any of the slides that you couldn't read during the presentation you can have a copy of the whole lot and go through it it's a question about what what about nurses who walk 15 to 17 or i think that means 15 to 17 thousand thousand yeah i interpreted it that yeah, way as yeah. well john although we yeah. did say 15 to 1700 yeah yeah um if um if you've got um you know, plantar fasciitis and you're, you've got a job where you have to walk 17,000 steps a day, um, then um, trying to get to um, a position where you can reduce that at work is part of the treatment for that. So um, nursing is hopefully got enough flexibility that you can temporarily unload, get rid of the problem and then reload again um, afterwards. And there are ways to move to be in um, nursing roles that are less intense. The one that's really difficult is the long haul flight attendants because um, I've heard from people in that industry that as soon as they put in a workers comp claim, they will never get long haul ever again. Um, and, um, you know, Qantas and Emirates and um, all of the um, international airlines are brutal in terms of um, one strike and you're out. So if you report plantar fasciitis, if you are doing the Sydney to LA leg, um, you will um, be put onto light duties and you will never go back to long haul ever again. And, and long haul soon has been very desirable as a way to work as a flight attendant. So um, um, it's really difficult. They're, they're some of the toughest patients to treat if you've got someone who is um, doing, because the, the long haul who go to um, USA or go to Dubai, um, they will often do 30,000 steps in a shift. Um, and if they've got plantar fasciitis, they're in big trouble because they, they can't, get enough annual leave to sort of get it cured because it often takes three or four months to get plantar fasciitis cured and they can't get enough annual leave to do it and um, um, they can't do a shift without um, you know doing 25 or 30,000 steps so it is really difficult with nursing there's a bit more flexibility and um, you may have to put a nurse on the workers comp and um, hopefully there's enough flexibility um, to move them. Uh, and they don't have to do no steps, that they just probably have to go down from 15,000 to 10,000 for a period and that might be enough to get them better. But if they insist that they've got three dogs and they want to walk their dogs for two hours a day on top of their nursing job, then something's got to give there. You know, that's the difficulty. So um, you may maybe not be able to have your cake and eat it. John, the last question that we have in the... Um... Uh, in the Q&A and I, we have a few minutes left. So if anyone has any other questions, please submit them. Uh, but this one says, what do you think about uh, turmeric or uh, fish oil or glucosamine? And I will add uh, uh, chondroitin uh, sulfate uh, for joint pain. Do they make the joints worse? Um, they don't make the joints worse. So if you're having a choice between them and anti-inflammatories or opiates, you would definitely take the supplements. Um, my read on the supplements is that there's probably not a lot of proof in their favour. Um, they, you know, like a lot of things, um, 
you know, you can find some studies that are supportive and then you've got a question, is the blinding good enough um, that you can't rule out a little bit of placebo effect showing the differences? And then there are, su there are some studies that show no difference to placebo tablets. Um, in the era where we've had all of these supplements on the market, we're certainly getting more knee replacements and more hip replacements. So it's not like they're a miracle cure, because if they were, we would be seeing a sudden reversal of hip and knee replacements. But if you've got someone who insists on swallowing something in, re in response to their knee pain, you would rather have a um, placebo um, Nutri nutritional supplement than you would have anti-inflammatories or opioids. So um, I, I wouldn't recommend them strongly, but in certain circumstances where someone is desperate to take something and they say, can I take that instead of a Voltaren? I would say, be my guest. And if someone doesn't want to take them, um, I would be very happy with that as well. So um, I don't take any of them myself, but I, um, but I also have patients who do that I don't discourage if it's helping them do all the other things right. And it's much less harmful than some of the things that doctors write prescriptions for. <laughs> John, uh, I know of, and obviously because I've, I've had shockwave lithotripsy for renal calculi. Um, yep. what, what, uh, tell me more about the, the shockwave treatment that, that you use. Where yeah. and when and how? Well, it's, it's, it's really interesting because um, the last time I checked, which admittedly would have been a year or two ago, I can't see any RCTs for shockwave for renal calculi. So I only see comparative, or sorry, double-blinded RCTs, so which are hard to do. But it's interesting, they have been done on um, plantar fasciitis and on um, calcific shoulder tendinopathy and on a calcific Achilles tendinopathy, um, some RCTs. And there is some data in favour of shockwave. And it's the same technology as um, that used for um, renal calculi. And it's aimed at a calcific um, fragment in a tendon or a plantar fascia. And um, the more I have used them, the more I, I, I tend to think that there's probably more placebo than anything else. I think there's almost certainly no harm with them. Um, is, it a, is it of benefit um, therapeutically? Um, even looking at all the data that I look at myself, it's really hard to tease out. The, the studies, when you pull them into systematic reviews, definitely look as though there's a benefit for shockwave for something like plantar fasciitis. However, the skeptics and non-believers will say that they think there are too many studies that don't have good enough blinding that, um, that the non-blinded patients might be getting a placebo effect and that's responsible for the apparent therapeutic effect. So I, I definitely use shockwave for plantar fasciitis because a lot of people say they're in agony and they need something and you do get a good percentage um, that say, oh my God, that shockwave was fantastic. You know, my pain dropped by half and um, it's a miracle cure, et cetera, et cetera. And I sort of chuckle to myself when someone says that because I know that even in the RCTs, the benefit's not that great and there must be some placebo effect if I'm getting that, but I don't complain about getting placebo effect. So, um, so shockwave is, I mean, but the irony is it's not funded for um, any of the musculoskeletal conditions. It is funded for renal calculi, as I said, without any um, RCT, um, <laughs> controlled RCT trials. It's just um, done, but not um, studied, or they do dose A versus dose B or shockwave versus surgery. Um, but it, it, it does seem to get done. And maybe um, it's a good example of um, what we said before about um, distracting the patient while their stone is passing themselves. <laughs> but um, um, but yeah, it, it, it's certainly a treatment that I can recommend as being benign and if anything, a, 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 a helpful placebo because you're encouraging them they're gonna get better. And I certainly only do it with load management. So if you come in to see me to get shockwave for your plantar fasciitis, um, it'll be what you get at the 35 minute mark of the consultation, not the two minute mark. Okay, look, it being very close to 8.30, I think uh, might be the opportune time to uh, uh, bring the meeting to a close. Um, Professor John Orchard, thank you very much for a fascinating uh, contribution. Uh, and thank you to all our attendees uh, this evening. Uh, and thank you for your, uh, for your question.